Okay, welcome back to part two. So this is a free part that I predict, and I was getting a bit tongue twisted before I stopped at bishop f3. So one of the points of bishop f3 maybe is knight g4, but there's another more subtle point about this pawn. It's, it's potentially dangerous. Black now has a constant threat of rook takes d3 and e2. Now imagine, um, combined with that, you know, this bishop was on the diagonal. If, if white wanted to take on b6, then bishop a7 and that rook takes d2, d3, e2 would be check. So it would be queening. So white has to be careful about this e3 pawn and this constant threat of rook takes d3. And if he wants to munch the b6 pawn, it's opening up that diagonal, the dangerous diagonal here, against white's king. So let's bear these, these ideas in mind as we navigate further in this game. Uh, okay, so g6 was played. So what, what on earth does g6 do, you might ask? Well, it protects h5, which means the knight's not the only thing protecting h5. So the knight can potentially uh, do something active, you know, maybe knight d5 or go somewhere else later. So it's, it's actually a bit of a waiting move. And it's also saying to white, you know, do you want to take my b6 pawn then? And I'll play bishop a7. So this b6 pawn, when, you know, when black had moved the knight to, to e3 and that, that exchange had occurred, you know, it was actually protecting b6. So b6 is, is now uh, loose. So does Anand have the guts to munch it up now and allow this, you know, bishop a7 with a bit of counterplay from black, you know, seemingly very dangerous. Well, actually, you know, he doesn't necessarily trust his 2805 opponent. And, and, you know, he's beyond, you know, psychological tricks. He's, he's looking objectively, doing concrete analysis and saying, yes, it is safe to take that b6 pawn. The diagonal isn't as dangerous as it looks. So he's going to, he takes bishop a7. Okay, so we've got to be careful here with, with white now for this rook takes d3 and e2. Um, you know, and also you might you might consider, well, you know, maybe this isn't a big deal. Maybe you can move the rook anywhere. Say rook b7. Well, let's have a look. Rook takes d3. So we're saying if takes, this is this is a disaster because the pawn's queening. Um, but, but, the, the observance among you might notice rook takes a7 here. Does black have any counterplay in this position? Black does potentially have either a rook d1 or rook d2. So, um, you know, maybe Anna doesn't want this continuation because black's kind of active. If he can get the other rook around, avoiding a8, you know, around, then, then that might be dangerous, especially this pawn. It might prove, you know, part of a mating net. If the king, you know, is, is chased out and the rooks become very dangerous, you know, you don't want all this black counterplay all of a sudden. So let's see what Anand does. In this critical juncture, he's just snapped up that b6 pawn, bishop a7. He actually plays the calm move, rook b b3. We could say this is a prophylactic type move against rook takes d3. He just wants to be able to recapture with rook d3. It gives him time now. Now that he's snapped up that pawn, and he's, he's restored material balance. Let's count the pawns. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Equal on pawns now. Black's got a bit more counterplay for his bishop than before. But what if, you know, white just moved the king outside of this diagonal? What if white played king g2? So white's got a bit of a breathing um, space here, I believe. But uh, Topolov plays kind of a, another aggressive, active move. He plays rook d4. So he doesn't mind the exchange of a pair of rooks. And if there isn't an exchange of rooks, he might be taking on a2. Now, if rook c7, I mean, that looks aggressive as well. And actually, that's what was played. You know, maybe, you know, this, this rook is going to snap this pawn eventually. And actually, as we see the, the game unfolds, Anand creates some interesting trump cards from this simplified position. So he does play rook c7, bishop b8. And now there's a very neat tactical positional sort of hybrid move here. And it, it does so many things at the same time. I wonder if I give you, uh, say, 10 seconds, can you look at this position and say to yourself, you know, how do I reduce black's counterplay and at the same time threaten to win more material? So I'll give you 10 seconds starting from now. It's a quiet move. Don't look for anything spectacular. Starting from now. Okay, rook c5. 
Now, at first, I, I, I had to engine check this myself. You know, what's going on here? Why can't black, for example, take on A2 and then maybe take on A2? It looks, it looks devastating. You know, counterplay. Why, why allow this? But here, I hope you can see the punishment if rook takes A2 was played. There's a neat little move. If I give you five seconds. Okay. Bishop C6. That would be um, attacking this rook and that rook. Nice little fork there. Bishop C6. So, Toplov cannot take that a, a4 plan, a4 pawn. So, was rook d4 wasted? That's the question. And not only that, e5 is kept under lock and key again by this rook on the fifth. And also, the rook is threatening now to take on a5. So, black has here a miserable position. What can black do? He's just losing a bit more material. White's going to be a pawn up. After, after doing a, a gambit you know, from the Catalan opening, white ends up a pawn up now. So he's definitely got his compensation, and more than that. The one downside, though, is that Black's rooks are becoming a little bit more active now. Rook c8. So there's seemingly, you know, very dangerous threats of rook c2. You don't really want to allow, you know, 2800 players to have too much counterplay. So here, Anand plays a safety move. He moves his king just to, to g2. So finally, you know, this, this rook d3 is, is going to be less dangerous potentially if, if there isn't my e2 threatening check. Um, so on g2 also, you might consider rook c2 is dangerous. That was what was played. It looks dangerous and logical just to get the rook on the 7th. And there's an interesting episode now. Anand is prepared to give a pawn back to try and neutralize black's counterplay. So how would he do that? These pawns are doubled here and seemingly ineffectual. The threats are being kept under control here. Rook takes d3, rook e2. They're not threats at the moment. e5 is under lock and key. The knight is also kind of restrained. White has nice control of g4 and d5 and e4. So this knight can't really go anywhere. So it looks kind of comfortable for White now. Finally, he's got an advantage. and it has an advantage. But how does he deal with this rook on the 7th? The move he plays is a3. Now a3, seemingly insignificant, does mean, well, he's not immediately losing a pawn, but also that the knight can now go to b4 if needed. So black does, does try and go for the a3 pawn. I'm not sure what else to suggest for black intuitively, because it looks as though white's kind of comfortable. If white's given enough time, you know, maybe he'll just play check and start marching his A pawn to the Queening Square. Or maybe just keep this rook on the fifth row. Just play rook B5, A5, and use this pawn as a kind of um, mechanism to stop the rook coming behind his, his front runner A pawn. So that's kind of interesting. Anyway, so, so the back A pawn is, is targeted now with rook A2. And now we see this move knight B4. So does Toplov want to move his rook? Well, if actually, if he moves to a1, then there's knight c2. That would be embarrassing, especially for a world championship match. So he can't do that. Um, if he moves back to d2, well, he's just lost a bit of time there. And what are the threats then for black? Say he moves to d2. I think white can just continue, maybe with rook b, b5 or rook a8 check and then a5. The rooks really need to be working together, these black rooks, to generate any sort of counterplay. So anyway, here, Toplov decides he, to liquidate. He plays bishop takes b4 with the idea of regaining a pawn. After a takes b, he plays knight d5. And here, it's, it's interesting actually. You might wonder, well, bishop takes d5, but remember this e2 pawn is under fire. So that might give um, black this dangerous e3 pawn off the check. Say there's rook f2, and then um, rook takes d5. Again, there's h2, and maybe you know h4 later. Too much counterplay to deal with. So really, um, and is not tempted by bishop takes d5. He wants to give a pawn back under favourable circumstances to reduce black's counterplay. So the move he does do is play b5. It's a very beautiful liquida liquidating move. Topolov takes on a4. 
he hasn't got really too many other aggressive options here. So we get a pair of rooks off. And now look at this lovely B pawn ready to roll with a rook supported behind it.